Hi class, we're going to focus on food poisoning now. Food poisoning is more of a symptom associated disease than a specifically um, bacterial or viral associated disease. So there's going to be a wide variety of pathogens that can cause food poisoning. Some of those include Staphylococcus aureus, Bacillus cereus, or some non-microbial so sources like bad fish, bad shellfish, or mushrooms. Food poisoning should it be suspected when a patient presents severe nausea and lots of vomiting accompanied by diarrhea and reports that companions that they've shared a meal with recently have the same symptoms. Onset for food poisoning needs to be quick though. It needs to be within one to six hours of the meal. So oftentimes some intoxication symptoms can occur that can be quite violent and that these symptoms are going to be manifesting themselves within a very short period of time. Here's a, t here's a table summarizing some common microbial sources of food poisoning. So we have Staphylococcus aureus exotoxin. This exotoxin that's produced by Staphylococcus aureus is heat stable. Also, if you look at Baris Bacillus cerus, it also produces a heat stable toxin. This means that even if you cook the food to kill the bacterium, the toxin that was secreted by the bacterium is still going to be natured. It will not be denatured and it could still cause you to be sick. Clostridium perfringens, though, produces a heat labile toxin and that heat labile toxin is capable of being destroyed by cooking. So if the Clostridium perfringens is the culprit, cooking will reduce the toxin's potency so that it hopefully won't make us sick. We also are going to focus on Giardia. Giardia is a disease caused by the pathogen Giardia lam lamblia. It's a pathogenic protozoan. And we aren't going to focus on many protozoan-based diseases, but this one is worth mentioning just because of how common it is. It was first discovered by Antoine von Leeuwenhoek when he was analyzing his own feces underneath a microscope. This protozoa is considered harmless um, and has been considered harmless for most of recorded history since it was discovered. However, as recently as the 1950s, it was starting to be recognized as a cause of diarrhea in some patients. Since that time, it's become the most common proto fl flagellated protozoal cause of diarrhea within clinical specimens that have been isolated. If we look at Giardia lambilia, it has a heart-shaped appearance to it. It's a symmetrical heart-shaped protozoa. It has organelles that are positioned in it, so that it kind of resembles a face as you look at it. There are going to be four flagella that emerge from the ventral surface of this pathogen to help propel it throughout its liquid environment. The ventral surface is going to be concave and will act like a suction cup in appearance. Giardia cysts, when it's forming the cystate, are going to be very small and will contain four nuclei in them. So here we have the trophozyte stage. This trophozyte is the active stage of the protozoa. It will have its flagella emerging from the ventral surface. And then if we look at it underneath the scanning electron microscope, we can see it has that heart-shaped appearance with its organelles arranged to make it look somewhat like a face. If it enters the dormant cyst state, it will have four nuclei present in it and resemble a small ovoid sphere. Signs and symptoms that are associated with a Giardia infection include a very long duration diarrhea. So this diarrhea is going to last for a very long period of time. There's going to be excess flatulence and there's going to be a greasy, greasy bad odor to the stool. So the stool is going to be particularly foul smelling. Generally speaking, fever will not be present. So if you see somebody who doesn't have a fever and has stinky, long-lasting diarrhea, they probably are going to be at risk of having a Giardia lambdiella infection. This protozoa has been isolated from the intestines of many different mammals, so beavers, cattle, coyotes, cats, and humans. Emphasis on mammal carriers or mammalian carriers. The trophocyte or active stage and the cyst, the dormant stage, can escape 
in the stool of infected patients, but the cysts are going to play the greater role in transmission. If the pathogen is entered into the dormant stage, it can remain as that cyst for two months in the environment before it can be spread to another patient. These cysts are typically going to be ingested by the patient with food or water after they've been in close contact with someone who is infected. The infectious dose of a giardia cyst is between 10 and 100 cysts, so a relatively low concentration. To prevent GR contracting this disease and to treat it, we typically are going to focus on a vaccination route. The vaccine against giardia can be given to animals and dogs. However, there is no human vaccine that's available on the market. We typically want to focus on avoiding fresh water that is untreated. This is a major preventative measure and was one of the reasons why you should focus on not drinking from lakes and ponds and mud puddles. If a patient does contract Giardia, they can treat it with tinidazole or metra, metron idazole. So in terms of things that can cause chronic diarrhea, we did not talk about the enterograd the enteroagrative E. coli, we did not talk about cyclospora, and we did not talk about entoamoeba histolysia. However, the one protozoa or one cause of chronic diarrhea that I really want you to focus on for your upcoming test is Giardia lamblia. If you have any questions for me about chronic diarrhea and food poisoning, please feel free to post them to the discussion board or shoot me an email. Happy studies!